Okay, so this is the aircraft carriers debate from myself and Jamie recorded, oh, well, three years ago. It's had over 10,000 views, which makes it the fourth most watched video on my channel, I think. Yes, the fourth most watched video on my channel. Um, so it's kind of interesting to go back and look at it. Um, it is technically two hours long, <laughs> which considering my previous, how long my previous one turned out, uh, it was fun. So I'm going to put the play speed, playback speed, up to one and a half, okay? I've heard that two was too fast. I'm going to improve the the audio is at the maximum that it could be at by that point because that was the maximum I was recording it at that time in terms of video and quality and um, yeah this is worrying let's make sure we start off at the beginning Dwarf Indoors why do we come up with that as a subtitle? He had notes. I'd like to point this out. Jamie had well, notes. I'm trying to get it on live, but it comes out at some point, either later tonight or early tomorrow. Yeah, it's not panicking. Uh, whenever it works, it doesn't work, just do it again. Um, yeah, so. I could do the pop-up. <laughs> Design. Yes, a character. It's always a fun topic. Hmm. Well, you know, you did sort of raise a few points that I might like. Um, you know, the, 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 the concept of the um, striker carrier and the, the, the back carrier. Um, well, I think and that's going to be the the cruiser carrier. And that's kind of carrier. Carrier. So the Royal Navy is basically looking at, it's all part of the Royal Navy looking at the sort of global approach and what they're going to be using their forces for. And it's very much, they're looking at the other Navy and they're going, you're talking about fighting a war, a fighting battle. No, I didn't mean like fleet carriers. Although, it's interesting enough that they, the, the, the cruiser carrier does sort of evolve into that. Um, basically, the cruiser carrier splits off into the escort carrier and the... I would argue that in many ways the Royal Navy sort of strips off because their idea of being the strike carrier was the largest carriers that could launch Alpha Strikes. So that was going to be Arc Royals, Implacables, those things. Then you're going to have the fleet carriers, which were the illustrious types. And then you were going to have sort of vessels which would do the escort carrier role. And originally they were sort of going to be sort of based on the unicorn, so light fleet carrier types. But Actually, what ends up happening is they mass produce, they're sort of mass producing the light fleet carriers to do the fleet role. They produce escort carriers to do the cruiser carrier role of convoy escort, and then the full fleet carriers all sort of merge into the strike carrier role. But it, it's kind of interesting how the Royal Navy does approach these things. They were looking at this very much with the limitations of what they could build under the treaty limits. That they couldn't get what they wanted. They couldn't get the full fat carrier they wanted. And really, that is the whole thing. That, that's why you get sort of the whole idea of the Ark Royal being a Far Eastern ship and this ship and that ship. All these things are built for different fleets. They're not. It's that they're built for the different roles of the carrier. But the Royal Navy can't build a carrier which has both the strike wing of an Ark Royal, the armor of an illustrious class, and they can then build that in the quantities they need to provide all the carriers they need. They can't do that. So they have to start breaking up that ideal carrier into its constituents and yes it can have therefore look like it's stronger in certain areas than other areas and that's quite right but it's not built for those areas it's built for those attributes to fulfill that part of the carrier mission that's not them. but they're thinking about fighting a war so what do they need in battle well they need a carrier which is going to be close to the battle group is their theory so it can keep up the strike and keep up constant pressure mm. just, and while well, having fighter coverage for the battleships and that's got to be the battle carrier that's got to be armoured, that's got to be, to an extent, protected enough that it can be as close to the front line of a fighting as possible. It's not going to be right on the front line. Although, do not tell that to HMS Formidable, HMS Victorious, and HMS Illustrious, which all three tried to on regular occasions. And we're very disappointed when they were told they had to go back um, by the battleship. Um, <laughs> and, or, and or get repaired afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's put it this way. There are certain classes which do not understand this concept of them being, they're, they're not supposed to be in the front line. Okay. Um, and... So you have that sort of, this is that, and you have the bigger strike carrier literally because the Royal Navy doesn't want to fleet hiding in sea, but also they want to keep another carrier back because they're very much thinking about 
Right then, so we'll have these carriers close, but this other carrier, we can keep that further away, keep it moving around, so that if you find us, you won't necessarily find it. And that will be the unknown strike passage. No, of course, yeah, that was a that's the, um... And it's the cruiser carriers, which are going to be backing up the cruisers. And, you know, doing the combat war. Trade protection, yes. I mean, okay, that was obviously, that's also the um, doctrine that Japan came up with after, or adapted it after Midway, <laughs> or attempted to adopt. Um, but at the same time, I'm not really seeing any sign of these um, strike carriers in the uh, naval construction lists. I mean, we're seeing Arc Royal. Yeah. Then we're seeing the six illustriouses, which are basically, which come in uh, subgroups, but they were all built, bef they were all laid down before World War II. Think um, about them. Yeah, well, you've got, you know, you know okay, indomitable and indefatigable. Um, yeah. Sorry, implacable and indefatigable. But they are still basically um, in indomitable hulls that have been refined and stretched somewhat. They're not, they're not exactly substantially different. So in they're my mind, I've always different. grouped them. They're not substantially different, but what they are is, it's going to sound, uh, sorry. Okay, so the idea was, once you're free of the treaty, why do I build a strike carrier which has no armour when I can extend and elongate the the illustrious the armour design, the battle design, and can get a carrier which can do both? So again, I'm going to argue here. The interest, uh, why then would you keep the implacables as basically treaty weights in that case? Because they weren't given much um, extra tonnage over the um, uh, over the um, uh, implacable anyway. So. It's basically speed of construction. It's they're, they're trying to get them out as quickly as they can do once they start them up building again. But they also want to build them to and one of the interesting. It's always this whole problem that you have in that you might have this idea of this dream carrier and converting this design to a dream carrier, but you can't actually build your dream carrier. And even if you convert it in time to actually be in service. And if you consider the fact that the real ones where they're sort of starting online are the Audacious's and then the Malters, where they're really starting to get their idea. And we often compare the Malters as sort of the people, go, people tend to call them the British Midways. Well, Midways and Malters really are the British and the Americans going for that same point. Because the Americans wanted an armoured carrier too. The Americans weren't stupid. They weren't, you know, they didn't like the idea of having wooden decks and all these things. They were doing that because of the treaty limitations and because of speed of construction as well. They wanted an armoured, a, a sort of a carrier with the capabilities of an armoured carrier. They wanted that survivability. You just can't get that and the size they need for their kind of carrier doc operations on the treaty limits in enough numbers. So both of them want this sort of this idea, this sort of ideal, but they're coming in from slightly different angles. I'd argue the British tends to be slightly more heavily armoured, mainly because again, there's a realization in Britain, it's infrastructure differential. The Americans, especially during World War II, have built up a massive amount of infrastructure and can more rapidly rebuild ships. Britain needs to try and make those ships more its ships more survivable because it can't rebuild or build new ones as far as quickly. So it wants to make them more likely to be able to be repaired, which means they need to be survivable. So they need to survive to the point at which they can get repaired. Things I find is that I can almost go back to the 1934 X design and go through that, and I can that was designed originally as the there was one version put together as the hybrid strike and armor carrier combined, which was what the Royal Navy would really have wanted if they had the choice. They'd have had all carriers built to this sort of combined standard. Essentially the audacious, really. Yeah. Is audacious the embodiment of the Zynex, you think? Yeah. So basically, that would have been their dream to always build. But on the treaty standards, they couldn't get their dream. So they went, right, then what's the next best thing? Well, we want at least four or four or five, six battle carriers and up to three strike carriers. So we'll build a strike carrier because we've still got courageous and glorious around. So you don't need to build the strike carriers that soon. Straight away. You need another one because Furious is getting old. And it's a, it's, that's always something you're going to worry about. Uh, will give you the strike coverage you need and time you need. Then you start building a battle carrier. And Sorry. A... Press the wrong pause button there. But uh, if I go back a second, let's carry and, on. And up to three strike carriers. So we'll build a strike carrier because we've still got courageous and glorious around. So you don't need to build the strike carriers that soon. Right you need another one because Furious is getting old. And it's a, it's, that's all. The Royal Navy were not planning on losing courageous and glorious when they did. That was not part of the war plan. And you think, look at both. Strange, uh, curious enough, okay. Glorious is lost going completely against Royal Navy doctrine for how to manoeuvre carriers and how carriers should be operating in a war zone. In fact, she's almost doing peacetime sailing with only two destroyers escorts. That's peacetime sailing escort strength. Theoretically. In practice, in peacetime sailing strength, if you look at Royal Navy back carriers doing movements, when they're moving around, there's usually three to four destroyers near them. Because the Royal Navy realises carriers are high value assets. 
and it's uh, someone was talking around to me when I was talking about this stuff, and they went, "Well, no, you can never find the movement orders of three to four destroyers going around." I went, "Have a look at the movements of the local float destroyer flotillas." Oh, there's a half a, a half a flotilla of destroyers making a movement at the exact same time, going the same direction. They're not a task force, they're not combined together, they just happen to be sailing not far against each other. Well, where do you think the photos of the Royal Navy carriers being sailing along are taken from most often? They sometimes are taken from the aircraft, but there are some which are curiously low level, and those are taken from the destroyers. It's, it's not a universal, but the closer and closer you get to, well, a rear admiral aircraft carrier is being appointed in 1930. The more it becomes the case, and after a rear admiral, uh, rear admiral aircraft carrier is appointed, and that was Admiral Henderson who goes on to become the first, uh, the third sea lord who builds the Royal Navy for World War II. It becomes a standard, and really that's always a sort of an interesting stat, uh, a sort of statistic. Then we look at the death of courageous. Well. Royal Navy doctrine was to use carriers for anti-submarine warfare. Cruiser carriers! Even though in fleet exercises, their carriers had always been okay, and they have been in some... They still had that sense. But the trouble is, at the point at which they were doing the operations, Argus wasn't worked up, and Hermes was the other side of the world. So they decided, let's have a bright idea, let's send some fleet carriers. Now here's the scary thing, people always think Courageous is out there alone. She isn't. She's with Ark Royal. The Royal Navy is using two of its strike carriers for anti-submarine warfare. So they're sort of following doctrine, they're using carriers for it. But they're using the carriers they weren't supposed to be using for it. And when Courageous is lost, someone looks at a doctrine is very thankful that Henderson by that point is no longer with us because he would have started doing nasty things to them for mucking up his doctrine so and losing a strike carrier <laughs> doing that and uh, no one repeats that exercise again no one it's always something you're going to worry about um, but you can build Ark Royal and that will give you the strike coverage you need and time you need and then you start building battle carriers and then it's also the battle carriers, the, the luxury class, are the ones on the stocks. So if you're going to adapt the design and start building quickly, you adapt the design you've got under construction. And also, by about that point, the Ark Royal design really wasn't... Let's put it this way. They had enough experience with the armour, they went, if, we've got the, if we can put in the armour, we're going to have it there on the strength deck, because this strength deck is useful. And what people often forget is the armour doesn't just go on the strength deck. There is also thicker plating between the hangar and the ship, because they turn every deck into a strength deck. And remember, the definition of a strength deck is when you put in enough steel rigidity, into, enough rigidity into that hull, into that deck, that it can hold up the sides of the hull. If it's just wooden planks on a steel hull, it won't do anything. But if you do have every single level have that rigidity, you're making the hull much, much stronger. You're also making it take far more damage and spread the load more. So you can put arms... You're also making it more expensive and far slower to build. Those are two other things you are... It becomes more expensive and it becomes... takes far longer to build. ...on a different level. And it can be different types of armour. Because you might put conventional armour plating on underneath the flight deck, but then you might just put thicker steel on the next deck down, which isn't as dense or as heavy as the armour, but will do almost as good a job, especially as anything coming through has had to punch through that armour, and then we'll have to hit the deck below, so it'll be lo losing velocity anyway. And these calculations are all being done. And one of the things I find interesting is the amount of stuff which is developed pre-war. And uh, it goes against quite a lot of the, of the standard idea, which is that this stuff all comes about in wartime. It's all wartime innovation. And I look at the quality of the drawings and the things coming through, and I look at all the volume of work they're dealing with, and I go, OK, yes, this might be a new drawing, but it's going to have large chunks which are taken from the previous design. And it's going to, in the case of the Audacious class, colossal chunks taken from the previous design. And then you've got the light fleet carriers, which are basically HMS Unicorn uh, <clears throat> modified. And of I'm course, not even quite sure how modified they can be, are you? In terms, in terms of uh, doctrine, though, of course, you have the two-year... And that is another point with Unicorn. Unicorn, you have to remember, is a forward aviation support ship, not an aircraft carrier. We have to be certain on this point. The Royal Navy stood up in... Various House of Commons committees, various committees, and pointed out that um, she is not an aircraft carrier. She is a forward aviation support ship. They filed it internationally. She is not an aircraft carrier. She is a forward aviation support ship.
This is going to take a long time, isn't it? <laughs> Delay spanner thrown in the works yep. of the um, rush to build um, escorts for the you know, the Atlantic War, the Atlantic battles. So I, I, that didn't only delay implacable and indefatigable, it also delayed the audacious. Yep. So I, I guess that's why you don't see this um, uh, you know, doctrine come together, dovetail together neatly during yep. World War Two. It basically, World War Two happens, the estimates they had, and the thing is, one of the things which is really sort of depend on this all really coming together even in peacetime in a neat fashion is probably Henderson, that's the third sea lord, staying around and like. And remember, he was supposed to go up and take command of one of the big fleets. That was what he was going to be sent to. I have a feeling with the way things were, they might have kept him closer and given the Mediterranean, but he would have been quite happy with the Far East, and he was both a Mediterranean and a Far East specialist. And in, the begin in 1939, both... Now, what do I mean by that? Well, senior officers in the Royal Navy start to develop specialisms. You can start to see that point from around the rank of commander, where they are deployed, where they are deployed in terms of their distances, because the Royal Navy doesn't want to deploy someone to be admiral of an area they don't have experience of. You might have to do that in wartime. You don't want to do that in peacetime. So Henderson's two areas had been Mediterranean and the Far East. He'd done a lot of work in Greece, he'd done a lot of work in the Eastern Mediterranean, a fair amount in the Western Mediterranean, but a lot in the Eastern Mediterranean. He knew, the Ottoman, uh, he knew the Ottoman Empire, he knew Turkey, he knew all these areas very, very well. He was also a bit of a Far Eastern specialist. He had done the China Station a couple of times. He had a full understanding of Japan. He had a very good understanding of the American patrols on the Yangtze River. He is an, he is capable of doing and dealing with both worlds. So there is always a chance that if he's around and they decide they don't want to replace Cunningham on schedule uh, or etc. Or they don't want to replace Boyd or you know all the various other options on the, the schedule they did do. Um, Henderson could de get deployed. Uh, not Boyd. It's the other B, isn't it? Pound. Sorry. The reason I was conf uh, conflating names, because of course, P Backhouse is the first Sea Lord, uh, September 1938 to June 1939, when he dies. And... Honestly, the Royal Navy loses its third Sea Lord and its first Sea Lord in the same year. Both died not far apart from each other. Um, Henderson, of course, and Backhouse both die. But Pound was supposed to be in station in the Mediterranean for a bit longer. And then he would have repla probably replaced Backhouse. And Henderson might have replaced Pound instead of, uh, instead of Cunningham. Well, Cunningham still might have replaced um, Pound, but then Henderson would have gone to the far, uh, the far east. But the two... Henderson and Cunningham's career, uh, Henderson and Cunningham's careers are very interesting in that they intertwine at several point, key points. They know each other very well. They have arguments, but they have great respect for each other. And I find it very interesting that Cunningham took the time to have Henderson's file opened when he was first Sea Lord to write his own notes about Henderson in that file. That. That's not something you do for every officer. You do, you know, that's taking time when you're first sea lord to do that. You know, it's not as if he's he, he's not got much on. He's first sea lord from October 1943 to May 1946. He's not as if he's too busy in that time period. You know, so it's plenty of time to go getting old files out of storage and start writing notes that will only be able to be read by someone in roughly 50, 70 years' time. But he considers it important enough to do that. Admiral Noble in the China Squadron and Admiral Cunningham in the Mediterranean were getting close to the point at which they were going to be replaced. So they were both sort of looking about 1940, and that was when Henderson was supposed to, after six years in, uh, nearly seven years in. I said Cunningham there, I meant pound. This is the trouble when you have too many animals' names going around your head, and you're going, that was that one, that one, and you're trying to think it through. <sighs> mm. Post was supposed to finally properly step down and go and get command, because they maybe didn't want to lose him. He was very useful, and they knew if they didn't give him another command, they couldn't keep him around or promote him to the first seagull. And they wanted him to come like a first seagull, because he managed to get the fleet built. 
and this was something the Royal Navy had spent most of the 1920s and 19, early 1930s arguing for a coherent fleet to be built. This guy becomes the first sea lord and he's able to articulate and make a case. And he's able to help the first sea lord and advise them in how to get these things made. And he gets the example I would give is HMS Unicorn, which is the whole way through called not a carrier. We've all seen HMS Unicorn. But that, according to all the official reports, when it's being built, it's not an aircraft carrier. It's a forward aviation support ship. And literally everyone seems to accept that. So this is a person who can literally make people see a horse when they're looking at a unicorn. But would he be, have he? I did like that line. So yes, and he would have been, imagine him as first sea lord. In a few a few years, sort of after that, uh, on the natural timeline, if he can make them believe that unicorn is not a carrier, i.e., a unicorn is a horse, and actually call it unicorn, imagine what he could have done as first sea lord. I mean, Lord help the other services post World War Two. I mean, if he was first sea lord pro up after World War Two. For any amount of time, he'd have had every single politician in Britain dancing to his tune. He's one of the few admirals who, well, how do I put this, successfully organises Churchill. That's a feat. If Henderson had still been alive and been still been third sea lord when World War Two began and Churchill makes his famous decision about capital ships and carriers being paused, I have no doubt that would not have come into effect. I have no doubt that Henderson would have sat there looking at him going, so let's work through the problems with this. Because Henderson had managed to do this on politicians who devoutly didn't want to spend any money on defence at all. And he'd managed to get them to spend money on defence and smile while doing it. The man was, the man was either a genius or freaking scary. It's up to you which one you go with. It's up to you. Be able to um, get the audacious and impeccable built earlier or not. Yeah, the, because think so, the, the, the depressing, you're still fighting the Battle of the Atlantic. We're talking starvation level uh, supplies here, well, uh, arriving the, in the UK. If you've got World War II going on, that's always going to change things because that means you start fighting and you have to deal with the short term. And trust me, Henderson is, Again, the plans which they turn, they do, the things they stop, are part of a ready process. They don't just suddenly go, we're going to crash stop them and don't have a plan in place. They do have plans in place for if war breaks out. But when they're building and they're talking about these classes, they're looking at a war that they were thinking they're going to have to fight in 1942, 43, 44. They thought they had another few years. And that's what they're looking at. And especially against Japan, but also against Italy and Germany, they thought they had a few years because they were tracking those nations to be on program. Yes. And the trouble is you have the one problem that the Royal Navy has, and all nations have this. They are tracking the rearmament program and they're basing it on the logic. They're basing it on the logic of looking at that rearmament program and seeing what's going to happen to it, seeing what is it going to be doing. And, you know, they sit there and go, well, they're going to have their rearmament programs ready at this point, so that must be when they're planning on war. They don't realize, they, they can't think, well, hang on, we, we have to be ready tomorrow because the politicians might go completely nuts. They can't do that one. They can't argue that one in the face of the Treasury, in the face of their own government. They have to be able to go, look, these countries are preparing for war by this date. This is what we need to do this. And they are talking about completely rebuilding the entire carrier arm of the Royal Navy. If you look at those ships they're planning, they are replacing every single carrier in the fleet. That is what they're planning, they're looking at. They are talking about repla replacing a massive amount of the cruisers. They are replacing a massive amount of the destroyers. They are replacing, talking about replacing, pretty much the entire battle fleet. And the Royal Navy is planning on trying to do this in as close to a decade as possible. A humongous capital expenditure, because they are sure the war is going to be happening in the mid to late 1940s. And they get halfway through. Yeah. They've got all the plans in place. They've got all that stuff there. And this is why another reason why I say, look, in World War II, what the Royal Navy does is goes, oh, we have these plans already. Let's build them up. They're already worked out. They're already designed to our type of operation, our plan, a concept of operation. And they keep very much to their concept of operation. So, you know, you, you look at what they're doing. And this is a point which is often forgotten, is the actual construction of ships due to the British infrastructure is the quickest part of their process. The design and development of those ships is the longer process, the part of the process. So when you're looking at a 10 year plan for construction and, and uh, going on, and he's coming up in 1932, didn't really get started until, uh, really probably started until 1937. And so basically thinking 42 to 47 is when it's gonna be finished. They are gonna front load certain things. One of the interesting things is that they are ordering the Hunt class escort destroyers, the Flower class corvettes, when they are. 
Because almost you'd say that's too early in the process. But then you think about it and go, well, hang on, which they consider most likely to be jumping irrationally into war? Out of their options. They don't consider Italy and Japan likely to jump into war irrationally. Why? Because they are building up steady, concentrated forces, well-balanced militaries. And those take time. However, there is a flash man in the, in the mix. Even flasher than the uh, uh, fat man, fa uh, fat, uh, uh, fat boy, fun boy, Mark II. That is, it was ruling Italy at the time. And, well, when I say ruling Italy, I mean ruling Italy in name only. Uh, it's really interesting looking at um, Mussolini's actual dictatorship and looking at his actual power. I'm afraid if there's someone who is... There are groups of people who are lit daily in the Senate of your own country taking the ham of you and insulting you. You kind of, your image as a dictator is kind of soiled a little bit. Just a little tad. Anyway, leaving that to one side, The Anglo-German Treaty and all these things around have been about trying to gauge German infrastructure and German capabilities. Had they done something which the British didn't realise? That, you know, the Anglo-German Naval Treaty allows Britain a lot of information about the German construction programmes. And allows them to get a lot of people into their yards. Under the cover of being stupid and being duped. It allows them to get a lot of information. And you can see that in the, when you read the reports about it, etc. And they're coming back. The Anglo-German Naval Treaty is a bit of a calculation. It's to buy Britain more time to get even further, because Britain realises that German infrastructure is not as good as they think it is, but they think it is good. Because we're looking at Plan Z. We're looking at the, what they announced plans is, plans are, and then we're looking at their actual infrastructure and their investment, and we're going, there is a huge mismatch here. And if you've got that much of a strategic mismatch going on between your projected force and your ability to construct a formation projected force, then what else have you got a strategic mismatch going on between in terms of your calculations? Because that's a fairly basic thing to get right. You look at what infrastructure you have, you look at, and then you go, right, this is the amount of force I can build in the next few years. And if you go, well, I want more force than that, then you have to go and back invest in the infrastructure. It's a very simple an analysis. If you're getting that wrong, what else are you getting wrong? So therefore they start bringing it forward the hunt class and the flare class, and they are ma uh, they are ordering them crashes. Well, cra when I say crash ordering, they are ordering those as fast as they can, designing, uh, taking designs out of storage, working through the designs. I've already talked about this in various sloop, pro sloop class works, uh, uh, various uh, videos about the sloop classes. And uh, the Rono has been developed this sub doctrine, this, uh, these ideas for the Andrew Summary Escort, and they take it and they go, yeah, this, this. This is what we can do. To go build this now. And that's why they are being ordered when they are being ordered. The designs are finalized in 1938. They're being ordered. They're, they're, they're under, they're actually have been started construction before World War II breaks out. And that's the reason for that is because the Royal Navy is already concerned. So this is why I don't tend to call things like the Hunt class, like the Flag class war emergency builds. Because they are a crash build to an extent, but they're being ordered well before war begins because they can order them before war begins. In the Pacific, when they're out there very specifically, and you look at how they're acting, and yes, they do take some ideas from the Americans and they do borrow from the USM, but also some of those ideas the Americans have been using have, been ha have come from the handbook, the, the handbook which the British developed in the 1920s and 30s and had given to them at the beginning of the war because the Americans didn't, uh, weren't as experienced in multi-carry operations. So the British had given them a handbook and basically gone, look, we've been doing this in exercises for years. Here, have this. And the That's one of the things I've forgotten. The Americans have done a couple of ex a few exercises multi-carry operations, but they were actually, usually they're just their big exercise, and they'd actually had less time doing them than the British. The British have been doing multi-carry exercises since the 1920s, when they had multiple carriers on both sides. They'd first of all started off with multiple carriers operating under the battle cruisers, the Vice Admiral battle cruisers, and then after a while, in 1930, of course, they have a Rear Admiral aircraft carriers, and Henderson, in one exercise, has I think, courageous, glorious, and furious 
operating together. There's a famous picture of them together in Malta. And they, the British are practicing multi-carrier operations. The trouble is, way World War II breaks out, A, they lose Courageous and Glorious early on. That's two of your carriers dropped. And then you need to have carriers in all these spaces around the world. And so you can't actually put multiple carriers there. But guess what? There's a good example of multi-carrier operations. If you look at the, some of the initial operations of Eagle and Illustrious together, before Illegal, Eagle has to is damaged, so repairing that damage means she can't take part in Toronto. Those there are some really great multi-carrier operations. Yes, it's only two carriers, but it's still it's a multi-carrier operation. There's more than one hull involved in carrier operations. And if you add in Courageous and Glorious, if they had not been lost the way they were, stupidly, you would have seen that a lot more. And there would have been a cumulative impact. You know, if if you have Courageous and Glorious in the Mediterranean, let's say, mm, Courageous with, with... Courageous with Ark Royal and Glorious with Illustrious and Eagle, well, A, Eagle probably gets maintained earlier because, let's be honest, there's going to be lesser pressure to keep her, insert, keep her operating because they've got three hulls, so they can afford to take one out and still have two for operations. So that means she's probably available for Taranto, which, let's be honest, those three carriers together at Taranto, and that's a lot more damage done on the Italian Navy. A lot more damage. The Italian Navy comes back from Taranto fairly decently. Not, uh, not, not massively quickly, but uh, quickly, respectably quickly. Oh, mainly thanks to the Gilio Chedre, which is just impossible to hit where it is in the harbour. Look, there are people come with all sorts of legitimate reasons for why it is so survivable and why life works out. But it's every sodding time. Excuse the French there. Every time. Uh, it just, you know, that thing is either under a blessed star or someone is manipulating events. But leaving that to one side, and, well, the poor vessel, her... her win for surviving was to go off and join the Soviets, so that was probably terrible for it. But the Royal Navy has quite a lot of multi-carrier operational doctrine developed in the 1920s and 30s. They just don't get the chance to use it because of their own stupidity. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit that. I'm going to say that because people are going to go, no, they didn't. They, they, they did. They just were stupid. Okay, they threw away their ability to do it thanks to two absolutely absurd decisions. The Americans went great, ran with it, developed a bit of war experience, and then handed it back to the Brits. So, if you look at those designs, people go, oh, that was all the American ideas. You go, hey, it, yeah, the Americans have developed and have added their own spin to it, yes. I suspect, I suspect you got a pretty hard sell on that line. Um, yeah, I, I do have a <laughs> sell on that one. But I, I you're going to have to get you're going to have to get granular level uh, evidence of that one. But uh, I, I mean, I've seen bits and pieces of it, and I can see definitely where it's coming from. The you know the early '30s multi-carrier carrier exercises, uh, as you say, with um, uh, Henderson and uh, and the likes, and also also the response to the Abyssinian crisis. That was again a multi-carrier unit, um, which you know by the way emphasised the need for a unicorn because they were suddenly experienced under combat-like conditions. The attrition rate of something like 10 or 15 percent of aircraft per you know uh, operation was through brilliant. It justified <laughs> Henderson getting a whole generation of light carriers. He was as yeah. There are, there are a few people who, it's terrible to sound that when we say, when we've got this crisis, it's terrible to be embassy people. But for the Royal Navy, that was brilliant because it allowed them to give a wake-up call to the politicians to go, in the nicest way, um, I, I, we know the, that our lovely, very good bomber service keeps telling you that they are going to win wars and everything. And they might do. We can't testify they won't because we haven't gotten tried it yet. But they can't exactly move that quickly, whereas the carriers can, so we need to support them. Yes, and, I mean, okay, back to that point, though, you know, the RN wasn't the only one doing these big war games. We had the... Uh, the Yes, and as those who were on Ascension during the Falklands War will tell you, it was a lot of effort to get the very small number of Vulcan bombers down there. The thing is, Vulcan bombers have an impressively long range, and quite a lot of bombing aircraft have impressively long ranges. But to actually sustain them, you need to build and support a very, very high-intensity base with a lot of infrastructure. Just look at how much goes into building the B-29 bases in World War II. So yeah, bombers can move. But Winston Churchill, this is a quote of his I will always agree with. Bombers have great strategic adaptability within the range of their air bases. Moving their air bases! Yeah, that's the tough one. 
Although I did mangle and adapt that quote quite dramatically, but you know, it works. Fleet exercises, the fleet challenges of the um, United States Navy. Yeah. And likewise, in 1929, they had um, a bit of a revelation, a bit of a, you know, uh, a, um, a blinding light on the road to Damascus when they had their, when, when Saratoga did the surprise strike against the, um, was it Panama? Yeah. Um, you know, that, that again also uh, opened up a whole new realm of possibilities, a whole new realm of, um, uh, you know, carrier usages. And I think that was followed up over the subsequent um, exercises as well with uh, strikes on Hawaii and fo following missions and uh, um, dual carrier operations. So is, is it more a matter of, is it, is it sort of a con concurrence of ideas? Um, or is it again a difference in terms of Pacific thinking versus Atlantic and Mediterranean? No, there is a concurrence in ideas, but what you've got is a different sort of approach on it. In that the Americans, is very much focused on battle. It's very much focused, when I read it, they are very much, okay, it, 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 the, academic, the academic in me would go Mahanian. It's a very much focused on battle, on the, the idea of winning the battle. You get sea control, you win the battle, and then you win the war. So you win sea control, and then you win the war. The, the big battle concept. Yes, the big battle concept. Um, it goes into War Plan Orange, which is their critical theory of thinking. The British one... And by the way, before anyone starts getting into the whole Mahan versus Corbett debate, I've covered this on very points on my channel, but it's basically it's a different emphasis. Uh, Mahan is about getting control of sea power and teaching it to a very not sea power focused nation. Corbett is about how you use sea power in a nation which at the time has a lot of sea power focus, has a lot of emphasis on it. They both include battles. They both include what happens after the battles. What you do with Control C and what you do to get Control C. It's just one emphasizes one more in their working and the other one emphasizes the other more in the working because of the crowds and the audiences they're talking to. So the difference between them is often more of nuance and context than it is in terms of intent. But still, we would say Mahanian or versus Corbettian in terms of when we're discussing which part, which phase of they're orientated on in terms of operations. The American fleet was orientated around the Mahanian sea control, gaining control of the sea. The British fleet was orientated more around... They already had control of the sea. So their first was about preserving control of the sea and using control of the sea. But, yeah. To be honest... At this period, the Americans should have been onto the Corbettian as well, but because of the because of the strictures put on upon them by Congress and the funding issues, they're not. They're still very much in the growth phase of their development. Is the British one is based on three phases, right? Then there's the initial phase where they expect, especially if they're in the Far East, to be outnumbered, outgunned, and not have enough forces there to begin with. They just don't expect they're going to. So what's the fleet going to do? Well, any carry out there, any cruisers out there will go on to economic warfare. Their point is to try and distract the Japanese fleet so long that it's tra trying to trace down these surface raiders that they can't mass and do anything. So that's why the Royal Navy prefers to have cruisers out in the Far East than battleships. You know, you deploy battleships are these great trader symbols, but they're actually not useful for the Far East deployment. They are not that good. You need what you want is you want cruisers, you want the cruiser carrier out there to try and deter, so the Japanese realise that, okay, they might start a fight, but their fleet's going to have to spread out all over the place to try and track down these service traders. And, yeah, sorry, Prince of Wales. It's kind of true. You were the worst thing to deploy for force sea. The whole thing. It, a carrier would, a solo carrier would have been a better deployment for force sea than a battleship. It's entirely the wrong thinking. It's entirely Winston Churchill and quite a lot of leadership's thinking of battleships are strength. But the thing is, if you're not able to deploy enough strength to fight the Japanese battle line and actually match them, then it looks weak. What you need to do is deploy something which is going to cause their battle line to have to go chasing its tail or ignore them while it's causing trouble. That's carriers and cruisers in this period. And it's definitely not you concentrate your cruisers into one fleet and you try and fight a pitched battle with an enemy with battleships. You don't do that. But you know. Interesting enough, I did a scenario a uh, while back in... Where was it? Uh, it was one of the courses I was teaching on Strategic Thought and I had them run the scenario and ta a tabletop game deploying HMS Furious rather than Prince of Wales with Repulse. 
deploying the two World War One sort of era veterans as the ships to deploy along. And um, <laughs> it did surprisingly well. It, you know, it was uh, A, what happened to 4Z never happened to them because, of course, they had fighters. They had their own air defense. And Furious, at this period, is not really the Royal Navy's frontline carrier wandering around. So you can actually deploy her. She's often sort of forgotten this point, but she, she can be got away from what she's doing. And, yeah, doesn't get four seed. And it's a big problem for the Japanese to try and work out how to deal with. And by the time they do work out a deal, you've, the timer counts down. Because what I did was, the whole scenario was you had to last. Your fleet had to still be causing the Japanese trouble. And they couldn't have attacked and really concentrated on Singapore before the reinforcements that could arrive arrive and the timer i used was the formation of the eastern fleet i .e. how long it took somerville's force to be built up to a suitable strength to come through and support them it was far better so there you go replace prince of wales with hms furious you get a very different scenario going on. You know, that's the kind of war the British are forced into fighting. And then the next phase would, of course, be the fleet turning up. And the fleet hopefully turns up in numbers, but they're preparing to fight their way through the Straits of Singapore. They do expect to have to do that. So then you, that's why you have the battle carriers. That's why you have those carriers of the fleet. So that the fleet's able to fight through there if they're ambushed as they're coming through. Sort of like, it's, a, it's, a, it's the Mulga convoy, but with Singapore as a destination. Yes. And then... Once you're through Singapore, once you're heading up to probably way high way is going to be where their forward operating base be. And they're going to have some troops with them to seize it. They're going to be in ships which wouldn't have looked too different to landing ships large, um, the big landing ship infantry large, those sort of big converted liners, with probably loaded with LCUs and LCAs and those sort of the little landing craft that the Royal Navy already had been sort of building in the 1930s. They would recapture Wei Hai Wei because they would probably have to take it back because they reckon the Japanese would have gone after it quite quickly. Especially if that's the best British place and the British place, place the British best know near enough to Japan to actually launch an operation from. And the strike carriers would be coming behind them. And then the strike carriers would be used to either force the Japanese fleet to come out to fight them or, or, or take out the Japanese fleet in harbour. And then they do a blockade. And the idea was if you could take out enough of the Japanese fleet early enough, you could actually make the war sustainable because then you could withdraw some of your heavy assets and withdraw some of your stuff back to the European theatre, keep an eye on the Germans and the Italians, who were still very much a problem. Remember, the nightmare scenario for Britain is fighting a war against Germany, Italy and Japan at the same time. And their fear is always that Japan will start it first, and then the Germans and the Italians will are opportunistic, and they will start it after them. Um, In the so end, of course, it all ended up being the opposite so, way around. Yeah. <laughs> and also, they didn't get to fight the war they planned, no. um, which, which I suppose brings us to the point uh, um, how adaptable were those armoured carriers, the battle carriers, to the roles that they were thrust into. Well, the point I'd always make is that the Royal Navy managed to use the strike carriers for the bluff at Toronto, and the armoured carrier for the actual hit. And that's the thing, you've got yes. Arc Royal hitting Genoa, and, everyone, and the Italians and the Germans go, where's the Arc Royal, where's the Arc Royal? So they don't know Illustrious, and they're just Illustrious sneaking up on them. And let's be honest, Illustrious is, it launches a strike, it's completely uncontested. Illustrious, it could have been a peacetime exercise, that's how little problems Illustrious had getting into there. It could have been a peacetime exercise. Yes. And the joke is, they actually have been doing that at peacetime exercises. They have been doing carriers getting in with range of Malta, launching long-range night strikes on Malta for about the previous 10 years in various exercises. That's how the Royal Navy is working. And that's why the Royal Navy had the swordfish, of course, because if you're going to be flying at night and you're going to be doing a long-range strike, you want something which is easy to fly, reliable, and can carry a heavy load, so that when it gets there, it delivers something worthwhile. And that was the swordfish. And yes, it wasn't as good as some of the aircraft that came later, but when it was developed in 19, early 1930s, it was the bee's need of what you needed. The fact is, though, the Royal Navy's successor, which they planned to get into service, was a bit now. <laughs> Poor old Albacore, yeah. Didn't, well, that didn't have the rubber. Oh, it wasn't just the Albacore, it was, there was, there was a, about two other aircraft as well, I've got them listed in my folder somewhere from my presentation, which came in after the Swordfish and just quietly disappear. Basically, they come in as Mark 1, just after the Swordfish Mark 1 has come in, and within a year, and then when the Swordfish Mark 2 comes up, they just go, so. And they're in service for about two years. One of them, actually, on the performance systems, you think you're better than the Swordfish. It has a better engine, it has more lift and all these things. Shark. Faster, everything. It should have been better. It's not as reliable. So the Royal Navy cuts it. And that tells you what the Royal Navy's thinking about. Because the Royal Navy's going, yeah, this is the aircraft which is better in every single stat, apart from reliability. 
So what, was, what that, that's the critical thing for the operation. So, uh, and that's the critical thing for night operations. If we think about this time, none of the advantages we have today for night flight and uh, night operations, none of the advantages we have, think about night operations to, uh, today. It, you don't have GPS. You don't have any of those systems. You are entirely flying by the moon. Your own ability to navigate with little lights and maps, and dead reckoning. And. The feel of the aircraft. Added to that, you have the Swordfish not only can carry a heavy load, it can actually, thanks to the Royal Navy's torpedo deployment system, deploy torpedoes in shallow waters very successfully. Again, that's a tremendous advantage. If you if the Japanese had been able to use the same not just the same fins, but the same wire tension wire system on their torpedo launchers that the Royal Navy did in Taranto, if they'd use that in Pearl Harbor, the casualty list for the US Navy could have been far higher. Because if you think about all those torpedoes which end up hitting the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and needing to be cleared up from the bottom of Pearl Harbor, that would be cut by 90%. And if you have that many more torpedoes running uh, running to their targets, you have a lot more hits probably generated. There is always the chance that all of them are, all of them turn out to be terrible and they will manage to miss. But the probability and the probability, if you run the simulations, mm, there's a lot more damage done to the U.S. Navy. A lot more damage, especially in terms of personnel lost, and that's. Honestly, that would be the most debilitating thing. Because the US Navy can build ships fast. They've got they've built the infrastructure they're building. They've used 1939 to 1941 to really accelerate their infrastructure construction. They're building better ships than they, their older ones. They are all the, they, they're equipping them better. That All these things are happening. But if they lose the numbers of personnel, those personnel are going to become the core of the personnel of the expanded fleet. And that has a knock-on impact to how quickly you can generate that new fleet. We lose um, Courageous and Glorious in 39-40. The only real, you know, the only uh, opportunity to do a multi-carrier operation is kind of thrust upon the Royal Navy in uh, 1942, April, and Operation C. So here is the clash that they had been planning for since uh, the early 30s. Yeah. Um, yeah. Difficult situation. I mean, okay, let's face it, it was only two aircraft carriers in terms of uh, indomitable and um, formidable. And it was up against five out of the six coup de bataille carriers. Um, would pro you know, this is not, not exactly an ideal face off, I suppose. No, but also you have. Well, I think I'm probably slightly harsher on Somerville than you are. Um, although I say he just had run out of luck and run out of energy by that time. He just wasn't lucky. Um, that's the thing. He has run out of energy. Oh, he'd, he'd only actually been there a couple of weeks. He yes. literally arrived aboard Formidable and, you know, um, hadn't even pulled into Colombo yet. Um, he met up with his forces. Oh, yeah, sorry, he had, hadn't even pulled into Colombo for a couple of days. Hadn't met half his force captains. Hadn't met the, ship, uh, the ships hadn't pulled together until he basically ran south. So, you know, but, it's not again, it's not exactly ideal. No, and um, I'm sitting there. But that was also one of the reasons why the Royal Navy ran all the exercises and training they had always done to sort of allow forces to quickly integrate with each other, even if they don't know each other. They've done so many exercises, they've done so There's going to be people who know each other, people who are used to this scenario, who understand what they're doing. Especially the senior officers and senior NCOs, they're going to know what they need to do almost instinctively in the forces, in the force structures. So that's supposed to be working for them at this point. Supposed to be. Looking at the officers, and there's part of me which was, which was, okay, if you've been lucky, you'd have had someone like... Henderson or Lister available, alive, available to do that. And honestly, I think if you're going to have a carrier battle down there, you should have probably had Lister go out and Lister be in charge. Because he's, after Henderson goes, he becomes the father figure for naval aviation. He is the guy who ran the, the attack on Toronto. He's the rear admiral, a former rear admiral aircraft carrier. He is senior enough. He could have been sent, but he's back being fifth sea lord. And of course he's fifth sea lord because the Royal Navy is currently having to grow its air on. So he's really essential where he is. But he's taken out for Operation Pedestal. So if he can be taken out for Operation Pedestal, why can't he be taken out for Probably Some because Pedestal had a slightly more organised um, run-up than Operation C. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, but no, you have... Operation C, 
okay, yes, they could have done with an extra carrier. If they'd had a third carrier, it would have definitely been a matchup, more of a matchup. And losing Courageous and Glorious, that, that's been a big loss for the Navy. That has caused a complete rebalance of the fleet and where they are, etc. Because you imagine if you had even one of those carriers still in service, there would have been a third carrier. It might have been a strike carrier. There would have been a strike carrier. There would have been one with a heavier fight over a heavier load. So you would have had a multi carrier, three carrier force. But what he, he does start doing the right thing. And I, I do like the way he organizes his forces and he does try his best. But. He was a very poor intelligence. Didn't he? he didn't know how many carriers there were. Um, one, of, one of the um, one of the uh, Catalinas that was shot down managed to get out a partial sighting report. That Catalina only saw a couple carriers. He didn't realise that there were five. At best, he thought there were two. Um, he, you know, he suspected there was more, but he only had only heard of two. So he, I guess he was hedging his bets when he was attempting the night conflict, the night yeah. engagement. And the night engagement is right out of the British textbook because also they know the Japanese are no good at night flight. They know. They have been watching Japanese exercises for the last twenty years. They have seen the Japanese exercise. The Japanese don't do night flying at this point, and they. They have a few aircraft, a few pilots who would be trying, but they, whereas the entire fleet air is night qualified, then they make a massive effort to make sure they are night qualified. They definitely are, and there's, there's good reasons not to make. It's very difficult. It's very taxing, and it's actually very deadly training pilots to land on aircraft carriers at night in this time. Even when you've got beacons, even when you've got lights, all these things. And also, there's the fact that when you are doing night flying, you do have to turn on lights, which do illustrate where your carrier is in the middle of the ocean. You have to do it. Otherwise, and I'd add also that. The Japanese criteria had included almost night attack and aircraft night strikes and those sort of things from the carrier based aircraft because of their plan to use their forces, especially their crews and destroyers, to launch long range torpedo attacks at night. And there was worry that they would not be able to distinguish between targets and they end up sinking their own ships and attacking their own ships. So it's better anyway, if you're going to have one, don't do the other. So you have legitimate reasons for why you're focusing and emphasising your capabilities as you are. The aircraft won't be able to land. And the British, uh, the British consider night flying as an advantage, it justifies that. But you can understand other navies which have made that decision not to. Uh, there was, of course, the whole experience of the German fleet hiding in Wilhelmshaven during World War One, which justified that for the Royal Navy to accept. But also there's Jutland which descended into a night battle and of course the Royal Navy really really had a thing about night fighting by that point after that but finally you have the scenario which I talked about at the beginning the fact that the Royal Navy expects to whilst they outnumber any other fleet in the world uh, on treaty they're the same size as the Americans in reality as I've said many many times I'm going to keep saying this because of the US Senate and their funding of the US Navy, the Royal Navy are bigger and are more spread out, they are more spread out. And that means that wherever they start off, they're probably going to be fighting outnumbered. If they're going to be fighting outnumbered, they'd rather be able to do something to offset that numerical disadvantage, especially in the early part of any operations. I, again, talk about that carrier with the operating with the cruisers in the Far East. Here's a dirty little secret. You, the, the odds are that if Unicorn had been in service and war hadn't broken out when it had, Unicorn would have been the carrier in the Far East, the deployed vessel in the Far East. Why? She's the perfect size for their operations and their needs. And she can maintain everything out there. And if she's sitting out there waiting out there, the moment they turn, out, she, uh, turn up, she's able to support their operations. So... And that's where she's needed, because honestly, Unicorn is not needed for operations in the Mediterranean. There's enough bases, there's enough things for them to get support from. They don't need her. Uh, she's honestly, yes, they needed, uh, would have needed her during the Abyssinian crisis when you put the full fleet carriers there. But in that scenario, then you bring her back. But if you think about it, where they automatically need her for any operations, it's going to be the Far East, where they don't have those major bases and lots of supply depots and dumps to draw from. That's where Unicorn's useful, and she could self-support herself out there. But, and I will start cross-examining you on this one as well, because it's not just going to be entirely me as much as you're having place. Well, you know, the 1930s is your, the, you know, the pre-war planning is your speciality. Yeah. And I guess I've sort of um, done most of my reading based on the eventualities of the war, and I don't have a lot of the context that you bring to it. So, well, you know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm already seeing... That's, that's, that's a nice one. Of my, uh... To get into this one, with some of them, he is... He's trying to plan out out of the textbook. But the thing is, he's not... What I would be doing, and what I think... 
from some of the reports which go through and some of the stuff you see looking at it in the Navy at the time, the general consensus is that he is, the Somerville at the beginning of the war, and especially of Force H, was always prepared to go with the Doctrine or to forget the Doctrine and try a new plan when he felt it was not necessary and try something else. But as the war goes on, he gets more and more tired and he gets more and more worn out. And you can understand that command is a tremendous strain. You know, I can talk about Philip Vian later in the war. I can talk about all sorts of losses through the war who do a long-term command. And the personality you're sort of dealing with at the end is not necessarily the personality you have at the beginning. And they get far... They might, the question is, how does that personality affect their command? Does it affect them in a sort of personal way? Are they seen as a nice or as a, car, a quieter person? Stanley Goodall, the great naval architect, the one who's the um, director of naval construction, those sorts of things. He starts off the war being considered a lovely, wonderful, personal gentleman. Very friendly by everyone. And middle he's one of his best friends is Admiral Henderson, who's the first seal of time. Of course, Henderson dies in 1939. Stanley Goodall takes on all the other possibly. By the end of the war, he's still considered a kindly man, but he's also considered a very austere man who doesn't joke, who doesn't smile. And he's run a visit war which has been seen 700 designs go through his design office, all sorts of things. And that's the effect it's had on him. He's still churning out excellent designs, but he's lost that personality. You can say with Philip Vian, he's the hero of destroyer force when he gets into the carrier force. He's not so good at projecting his personality wider. His personality become more attractive. So the people who personally work with him say how lovely and friendly he is. And of course, he does things like he's always hunting down different. Any pilot who goes down, he tries. Oh, air crew goes into the, is down. He tries to better recover them. These are things. This is the original Philip Vian. But he's not so good at projecting that personality, that kindly nature around his wider force, which he did so well in the tribals at the beginning of the World War II. But he's still good at making decisions and command. I would say the trouble with Somerville is that he keeps the personality, you can see that because of the way he managed to work on Ernie King, and actually makes the, the USN CNO, Admiral King, of course famously was not that keen on Brits. He loved Somerville. They were very, very good pals by the end of the, Somerville's time in Washington. So he kept the, but he loses his command edge, if anything. He loses the ability to, think, to take, trust himself outside of doctrine. So he's trying to do the doctrine and pure doctrine in a situation which, in a massive way, he hasn't got the strike carrier. He hasn't got the things which would have made that doctrine work in that scenario. So you need to either adapt the doctrine or come up with a new doctrine. And it's the confidence to make those decisions. And then you've got, so you see, this is why I say some of them are good, and he doesn't do anything necessarily wrong, it, uh, especially according to doctrine, but he doesn't do what Somerville could have done earlier in the war and would have done earlier in the war. And I sit there and I'm looking at it thinking, actually, if I've been going as a lonely lister, definitely I'd have said I might have done at Harwood, actually, as well. Although he's very junior, he's only a rear admiral at this point, I think. But Harwood is, again, an officer who thinks outside the box. And actually, keeping him as far away from the army and the RAF and into those politics is probably a good thing for Harwood's career, considering that's what really mucks him up. Um, there are a few officers sitting around who are quite good, who could have been sent instead of Somerville. But Somerville's sent because of his reputation from Force H. The trouble is they're not getting the Force H Somerville. They're getting the post-Force H Somerville. And he has used up so much energy, so much, that it's not the same Somerville. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see what you're saying, but also I'm just looking at the circumstances. You know, he's there one week. Yes. He's, he's there with a, um, a a very green carrier in the form of HMS Formidable after she came back from repairs. Um, air crew had barely worked up on the deck. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, a, basically your cruiser uh, trade protection trade warfare force suddenly having to pull together to work as a fleet unit, which they hadn't done since 1939. So, you know, you're talking, it's not, I'm seeing a lot of things um, that are pretty much not pretty much impossible to pull together uh, in that sort of time frame in order to take a risk, in order to take a doctrinal leap. Um, but before we go on, I suppose we actually should explain, and I want to edit this back in a little bit earlier, what, you know, what is Operation C? And Operation C is, of course, the Japanese foray into the Indian nation by its uh, pretty much its entire carrier force. The only carrier that wasn't there was cargo after it had run, a, run onto a rock. Um, and it pretty much came in and stomped over Ceylon. Um, so, or Sri Lanka, as we now call it. Yes, I suppose I should <laughs> try and remember that's that as well. But, um, I always add in both because I always tell people both when I'm doing lectures because yes. I go, well, A, countries and nations change for very good reason. Uh, but B, you need to know both because in some of the old sources which are written in period, they were referred to it one thing. But if you're looking for those factors these days, you often find them in the, in the libraries under the new name. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Nagumo was there to destroy the British Indian Ocean Fleet. Yeah. He was there to destroy the Eastern Fleet. That was his sole purpose. You know, smacking around um, Solon, Sri Lanka was basically his uh, way of trying to draw the British out to fight. Oh, yeah. um, now, you know, the Royal Navy got uh, lucky with uh, quite several intercepts of uh, key messages, which told them that the um, Japanese carrier force was on the way. But it was a few days out in terms of the day that it was um, expected to arrive. Well, actually, no, it was correct the first time. It was correct at first, but Nagumo was running late. Um, but uh, the, the uh, cryptologists missed the uh, revised schedule. So, you know. It's so annoying when your enemy tells you their battle plan and then they run late. They need to be able to run to time. Now, listening to all this, especially discussion about Somerville, 
Yeah, the more and more I've looked into it, the more and more I think Somerville should not have been sent. The more and more I think it needed someone else. Um, Vian and Harwood are probably both too junior at this point. There are a f Lister is a good option, but he, they don't want him deployed that long away from home because they need him to run the fifth uh, to be fifth sea lord and mastermind the creation of the new fleet air arm. It's a real question as to who should have been sent. There are some officers, some good ones, who are not massive names at this time, but who could have been justifiably sent and would have been good to have sent. Um, one of the ones often, often overlooked and often not considered is Tovey. Admiral Tovey of hunting Bismarck fame, etc. In 1943, he would transfer from Home Fleet to Commander in Chief the Nor. He was not going to get any more senior than that. But honestly, Tovey could have been a good choice. He did understand carry operations, he did understand the needs of these things, and it could have been spun as a fitting reward. Oh, yes, we're supposed to give you, after this point, you're supposed to get the Nor, but we'd rather give you something that's some sort of active fleet command. Would you like to go to the Eastern Fleet? It's also interesting to have him out there as a prestige thing. But there are other options as well. But, you know, it's just... the Very often, when you're looking at the, some discussions which go on in the government around this time about choosing officers for operations, about choosing who they're going to send to do what and do this, it narrows down incredibly quickly. It really does. It narrows down incredibly quickly, and you're just looking at it going, why? Why are you narrowing it down so quickly? That doesn't seem to... And it's almost as if there are certain names who are called upon, who spring straight to the mind of, especially the politicians involved. And again, this was something where Henderson as third sea lord was pretty darn good, but also Cunningham as first sea lord is also fairly good. Is by reminding politicians there are people they don't know who are good as well at the job. There are people who might be less famous, might not have done the more prestigious operations. But they're good, and they're there. They're available. Um, some of it was out there, and he was ready. He'd had, he's, he's, he's got his two carriers working together. The carriers working together um, in a hurry. He's got on board them a whole bunch of albacores with um, ASV, the surface radar. Um, they'd even pulled in a um, swordfish uh, from a reserve that still had its, its air surface radar on board because, obviously, they were thinking in terms of what the Royal Navy had practiced. You know, What's that swordfish from the anti-submarine force based in Salon? I believe so, but I haven't really gone far enough into it. But I, my understanding is, is yes, because I have seen that mentioned, but I haven't seen it confirmed. I've also seen it. I mean, I've seen it. I mentioned that it was actually uh, stowed away in uh, spares on um, <laughs> on indomitable and reassembled. But uh, so I'm going to have to check that one a bit further, I guess. But, I think um, there were quite a few swordfish going around. I, I know historically we talk usually about one, but it's going to sound strange. My experience, especially with the operations which resulted in Taranto and other things, means that the Royal Navy seems to produce swordfish torpedo bombers, PSRs, from all sorts of places whenever they need them. And it's kind of like the uh, the naval equivalent of, um, I don't know, the knitting lady, a uh, knitting lady and gent or a gent who always stores their, fre their spare threads, even a little bit of thread left, just in case they need it. You find these swordfish pop out from everywhere. This is throughout the entire Second World War. Suddenly you go, I'll oh, carry a strike troops down. Don't, have a don't worry, we have a couple of swordfish for it. And you go, swordfish aren't and, strike yeah, well, anymore, they're not if you had a and I'd add, you know, the good example is the gladiators that found at Malta that were boxed up. And the, those gladiators, I think they're Faith, Hope and Charity, um, go on to provide air defence for Malta for quite a while. Uh, it's The Royal Navy has been storing away aircraft for a long time. They have a lot of swordfish. If you had a radar equipped swordfish, you wouldn't be chucking it into the scrap heap anyway. No. Be using it, as you say, for any submarine patrol from harbour if necessary. So, yeah, it would make sense that there was one around somewhere, in, regardless. You know, I have no had, idea um, what my hand is doing at that moment. You know, night qualified, night capable, night, they, they, as I had proven, um, was actually uh, stowed away. In, uh, my stowed. only defence, that's about right height for if the dog is sitting on the bed. 
Um, it's not it, it's not able to be doing anything at that sort of angle because you know that sort of angle. There's nothing rude going on. I just have no idea why it's sitting there shaking. I know that's not completely not the comment I'm supposed to be making, but you know. Here's on um, on indomitable and reassemble, but uh, so I'm going to have to check that one a bit further, I guess. But, I think um, there were quite a few swordfish going around. I, I know historically we talk usually about one, but it's going to sound strange. My experience, especially with the operations which resulted in Toronto and other things, means that the Royal Navy seems to produce swordfish torpedo bombers, PSRs, from all sorts of places whenever they need them. And it's kind of like the uh, the naval equivalent of, um, I don't know, the knitting lady, uh, knitting lady and gentle, uh, gent who always stores their, their spare threads, even a little bit of thread left, just in case they need it. You find these swordfish pop out from everywhere. This is throughout the entire Second World War. Suddenly you go, I'll oh, carry a strike troops down. Don't, have a, don't worry, we have a couple of swordfish for. You go, swordfish aren't and, and, you know, well, anymore, they're not if you had a yeah. If you had a radar equipped swordfish, you wouldn't be chucking it into the scrap heap anyway. You'd no. be using it, as you say, for any submarine patrol from harbour if necessary. So, yeah, it, it makes sense that there was one around somewhere, in, regardless. And, you know, on board, you had um, full Mars, which are also you know, night qualified, night capable, night, they, they, as I had proven, um, tracking, uh, um, tracking Bismarck in the horrible weather and at night. So, yeah, he'd, he'd had, he'd, he'd by this stage, seen that the night concept had been proven, and he'd uh, also had this nice new toy radar there. Uh, which apparently he had been, been given a very um, dramatic demonstration of, uh, flying on board a um, radar-equipped aircraft. I think it might have been a swordfish, could have been an alpacore. Uh, after getting uh, his testicles fried by electrical short, um, the um, observer managed to guide him right over the top of his own flagship in the middle of heavy um, cloud, which was uh, Renown, and he just basically brought the aircraft down on top of, the, on top of Renown, and uh, from that point he was supposedly sold on the uh, idea of radar yeah. on, the on the aircraft. So, yeah, they had those things there, but um, it was still patchy. Yeah, there were some sea hurricanes, it was, a it was a very painful experience on multiple levels, that particular history. Um, a very, very painful experience on multiple levels. Whew. But it did teach Somerville, and he passed it on to the other senior officers, the value of radar-equipped aircraft. It's, it was all a bit of a mess in terms of the carrier aircraft. I do agree, which is why I, I can understand. Look, he's planning his operations for a night attack and these sort of things, and I can, yes, the time go out and there are all sorts of good reasons that he doesn't do what he does. This is why I don't say he's a bad admiral. This is why I say he's an unlucky admiral and in, at this point, and he's not the full sum of all of four sake. Because if you can see what he'd have done earlier in the war, when he was faced with similar issues, and he had faced similar issues of a fleet he wasn't sure where they were, were what they were doing, and he's supposed to go in. He, and four sake, when it comes together, is not much more than this for a group, and he brings that to a further quickly. But that's why the Royal Navy did the major exercises every year to done for the previous years. So even if you had to do it, bring a fleet together quickly, yes, they might not have worked up with a fleet recently in that individual ship, but a large majority of the senior officers and senior NCOs would have done many, many fleet exercises. So in the nicest way, those ships could work together pretty quickly, pretty well. Okay, it wasn't going to be perfect, but in like, you know, okay, it's not as if those ships hadn't taken part in major exercises, hadn't been part of those things many years ago. And also their captains, their executive officers, most of their senior lieutenants would have done many, many exercises. And that's why the Royal Navy worked as it did. And uh, we so, Ultimately, though, uh, there we are. On the, uh, I forget the specific night, but you are—you have the British carrier force and the Japanese carrier force 100 miles apart from each other. Yeah. And you have um, a couple of albacores getting shot down, and one or two getting back in um, rather bedraggled state mm -hmm. to give their sighting reports. Um, and unfortunately, one of those sighting reports was made either a little bit too early, i.e. just before the Nagumo's force turned around and started heading off in the opposite direction, or it gave a reciprocal uh, sighting report through a state, which is not un unknown. Um, and they miss each other at night, but and mm. um, that's ultimately the problem because even if the Japanese have the advantage of five carriers to two, if the Royal Navy managed to knock out two or three carriers at night, and as has been shown, it doesn't take necessarily much damage, and especially if the Japanese with their limited radar uh, etc., a night strike coming in is going to be unopposed until they realize it's there. They don't have the fingers to guide fighters in, even if they are launching them at night, and they aren't. The British can get in, launch a strike. We're using their radar systems. They could probably gun themselves in on the largest ships. So they could theoretically go for all five carriers. But the odds are they get... Well, there's groups of two... Uh, there's two groups of two... Uh, there's a group of two and a group of three. So, theoretically, they either get the two or the three. If they get the two, then it goes down to three versus two carriers. And the Japanese don't really know where the British are. 
So yeah, they'll search out for the British. They might find them, they might not. Again, British fight, fighter patrols might stop them getting in, but it, it, it's a case of the first blood in that scenario, to use that very crude phrase, will probably go to the Royal Navy. What happens next day is going to depend on the Japanese. Also, what happens next is also going to depend on the, but uh, will depend on the British because the British launch a strike, take out two carriers, but catch glimpses of there being more of a force out there. They might try and launch a second night strike. They might try it. They're very tired crews, but they might try it. If they did that, that could be goodbye to all the Kido Batai, and that would have been a dramatic thing. We discuss that more as the video goes on. But Yeah, I remember this this was a really fun thing to do and this was part of the reason I really enjoy YouTube is doing videos like this. I've got to do more collaborations. I have got to do more. So before I start recording again, I'm just gonna add Yeah, it's it's split over two days. I had fun yesterday. Uh Mum's medical appointments and med uh, even more of those are coming up. Believe that to one side. Um, I've noticed something with comments recently that some people seem to be disappointed when I comment below a video when I'm just writing a comment that I don't give a massively detailed reply like they sometimes do. And there is actually a logical reason for why I don't do a massively detailed reply like they do. If I was going to do a massively detailed reply, I'd turn it into a video because don't take it the wrong way, but I have learnt Lesson 101 from <coughs> my colleagues in Shipshape was basically being a... You don't get pet, you don't uh, have any money towards your book habit, and I'm going to call it a habit, not an addiction, book habit. This is all a habit, and your research from comment responses. You get... Well, I say comment response, uh, a comment response as in comment, a writing comment. You you only get money from YouTube for what you put into a video and what gets seen by people. So that tends to reflect, be reflected in sort of some of my answers. So when I say something quickly like, yeah, the radar wasn't working that well, or this, that, or the other, and then some response going, well, I think by me, radar, I mean, da, 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 and gives a massive list of details. That's fine for them to give. If they want to choose to do that, that's fine. But I'm not going to give that down. It's not me being rude, it's just me being sensible. Because the time it takes me to write that link of article and to sort of do the research to make sure I'm getting everything right and make sure I've not got dyslexics with the uh, designations of the, com uh, with the of the numbers. If I, if I spend that time doing that, I might as well put all that together and record a video. And I do sometimes do that. In fact, there are a fair number of topic videos which come out which are responses to people's comments. Because the best answer to them is a video. Anyway, let's continue this. He was in position, ready to go, ready to make that, yeah. to, to do that fight. It's basically only the next day that the details come through that actually, no, there, were, there aren't two carriers in that Japanese force, there's five. And it's then that he decides, nah, I think I'm not going to try it again. So, but you know, here's the thing. Imagine if he had hit that night and had taken out any of those carriers, or uh, considering Royal Navy doctrine was to always head for the carriers in a night strike. Imagine he'd taken out two, three or four of those carriers. Or even two or three. And with the big torpedoes and the way the Royal Navy practiced night strikes, and also, nice the way, the Japanese air defenses and things at night, they didn't really have that effective radar. I don't think that actually, I'm not sure if that task group actually had any radar in it. I mean, it might have had. I don't think they did at that stage. No, but I don't think they did. No, none of the ships with radar were in that force. Um, so, night fight and... Uh, it's one of the classic things. They do have ships going around which are being fitted with some experimental radar. And sometimes you have to remember exactly which ship was where. And sit there and go, go mentally through the list of ships and that's also going, are any of those ones fitted with the experimental stuff going on? No, they're not. They're not. Which is kind of strange, because you'd think, if you're sending a force off to the Indian Ocean, as far as you can go away from Japan, really, if you're going to send radar with Anna, again, put radar with Anna, I think you'd think you'd send it with that, but there again, if you don't want your radar to get captured and you want to 
make sure you have it safe so you can learn from it, perhaps you don't. There are falls and against. For the swordfish on the albacores, that would be blooming brilliant. There's nothing to fight back at us. They're just firing machine guns wildly in the air. That will take that any day of the week. Um, so that sort of fall, that kind of scenario, they're going in, they take a... Imagine the Americans' reaction if the Royal Navy had sunk the carriers which destroyed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I don't think Admiral yes, King well, like you know. Somerville then. <laughs> Mainly my thoughts on that one are literally... It's not a, a jingoistic thing on that scenario. It's literally me picturing Admiral King's face, who Admiral King was, of course, famously not really keen on the British. He been put off by BT. I can understand anyone being put off the British by BT. Honestly, BT would probably put me off the British. So I fully understand and I'm on board with where he comes from on that one. But Admiral King's face, if the Kido Batai, even any section of Kido Batai, let alone the whole Kido Batai, uh, Kido Batai or those five ships, get sunk by the Royal Navy in a night strike. And again, this is one of the things you have to remember with the, the radar strike air, guided strike aircraft. Just as Somerville could be taken down and flown over his flagship in the middle of a in the middle of a cloudy, uh, you know, a, a cloudy, cloudy space, a, a sort of dark night, they could spot and pick out with the size of the ships on the surface radar. Now the the search radar. Now again, it's the thing is about this sort of force coming into the the key to, the force that's striking in Nagumo's force striking in. The biggest ships are all going to be the carriers. Yes, there are others around, but let's be honest, if they sink a Congo, that's still quite good. If they sink carriers and Congos, and the thing is, again, the scenario that comes back to it here is, yes, I do agree, albacores, swordfish in daylight, they don't really stand much of a chance against the zeros, no sort of scenarios in Japanese air defense. At night, where those things can't attack them, and this force in this time can't well that's what they were designed for that's what the Royal Navy was designing a swordfish and that's what the albacore to an extent takes on from its design heritage is the swordfish heritage they are designed for long-range night strikes they're designed to be stable and go in at night and hit at targets at night guided in by radar that's just <sighs> I, I think I think this is one of those scenarios where we're going to have to definitely try and get a, um, uh, you know, a, a high resolution war game set up to, to see what the potential is. <laughs> uh, yes, a high resolution but, uh, war game. I, I, but also, I, I, th I still. The, policy... the thing is, it's again, it's one of those scenarios that if it happens, if the night strike goes in, I would say at least two, because they're going to attack task groups, and they, maybe they miss the others, but. The moment they get a second task group out there, they're going to be taking out a large number of those carriers. And yes, the Japanese might launch a strike the next day, but also Nagumo might go, I've lost this many ships, I better, I better get out of here. There is always... The Japanese have the Kentai Kesen decisive battle doctrine, they do have... And later in the war, they suddenly have the... Kamikaze divine wind idea going on and various other forms of that but they're not stupid if he thinks he's being pounced and he's being attacked at night his presumption is going to be there's a lot, far larger Royal Navy force in the Eastern Fleet than he heard about his presumption is going to be that he's dealing with a four or five carrier task force somehow he's not going to show how it appeared but you know maybe the British were lying or something uh maybe they've got American help maybe he won't know but he'll believe he's facing a larger force because he won't think that he's been taken out by two carriers just from the advantage of night strikes that they able to basically use one squadron per carrier six side of the Americans going <laughs> oh it would have been great for the Royal Navy. It would have been the new Yeah, but also, of... it could have e easily have gone the other way. Let's face it, they only had one decent battleship, was right? You know, the two R class were in Group B, yeah. bringing up the rear because they were so slow, and um, 
uh, because they basically didn't have enough um, distilled water to keep their condensers operating, to keep, to keep their engines running. Um, you know, it it still was a very much a David versus Goliath scenario. Oh yes, but if you take out those carriers, you do have the advantage that he can they can range and just go, what can you do? You know, in the nicest way. It, even if he doesn't take out all those carriers, you take out enough of those carriers, you're going to damage that force's ability to structure, and then you hold off for a day, you keep as far back as you can. And the Royal Navy does have radar-directed fighters, and Martlets and Sea Hurricanes, they might not look like much, but them and Full Mars are all fairly good at the interdiction interception thing, which is going to put off any strike force. They might not be able to toe to toe on a nice spreadsheet. They don't go toe. They don't might not match up against your and against the idea of a perfect zero engagement. But let's be honest. If you're in any of those three aircraft, you're far more likely to survive being hit than you are in a zero. And they've got some pretty heavy machine guns and heavy firepower in them. So they've got firepower. They might not have. They might not have speed or turning ability, but they certainly do have firepower. And they have radar direction, and that, that's an important thing, and they have a lot of experienced pilots. Again, you have to remember the British and American systems did a lot more to bring experienced pilots back to train up the, tra uh, the junior pilots, and then sort of, it, it was a, your life cycle as an officer would be to serve in a squadron, gain experience. Maybe you'd become a flight, uh, maybe you might become a flight leader. And then you go back and be an instructor. And then after you turn as a instructor, you get attached into a new squadron as a new sort of as a as a more senior rank than you being. You might be a flight leader if you're the most junior or at a junior sort of level, but you might be a uh, squadron leader, squ uh, even squadron commander. And then you take out the squadron of people you've trained up. So you've got constantly got experience going backwards and coming forwards. It's a, it's a constant cycle. And it means that your squadrons at the front are never full of all their experienced veterans. So they're never as the best they could be because they're never 100% veterans. But then none of them are never 100% newbies either. There's always a mixture. And that gives you a better, quali uh, better level of experience overall in your force structure than you might achieve with the Japanese system, which basically has a has almost has the wing raised together and served together and you know they know each other intimately they uh, really do understand how each other fights they can almost carry out combat without even talking about it because they know how each other's going to behave in the scenarios because they train to go so much and it really does produce a very very highly crisp elite force but even by this point in world war Two, the japanese forces are starting to suffer because they aren't getting the new uh, the new recruits coming forward that are patching the holes being left by veterans aren't trained to the same level they aren't getting that level of experience because the veterans aren't going back to train them because the japanese don't want to draw them because they want to have their best people at the front and it's a sacrifice it is a sacrifice to make the decision to take your best people off the front line to take them back to train the people coming through you are accepting willingly accepting you are going to have a deletery effect on your forces but longer term it's going to give you better forces better overall forces and radar guidance yes yeah. you know in nicest way Somerville could have unknowingly and without realizing it have won a second battle of Trafalgar because he only thought he was taking on two carriers and when he finds that he's taking on five he then goes aha but this is the point again, or he could have lost he yeah. also could have lost two yeah. of the Royal Navy's only three modern surviving carriers. Yes, and a battle, and the, one of the critical battleships. He could have lost quite a lot of force. But don't I think there was three at the time because there's victorious, uh, indomitable, illustrious, formidable. Those are four. There are four modern carriers wandering around at this point. And Unicorn, Implacable and Implacable are not far off. There's also Furious. Their Eagle's gone, I think. Is she, is she gone or is she gone? Does Pedestal take place later? Um, let me check the one. 
Yeah, Operation C was April 1942, March to April 1942. Eagles lost in pedestal, which was on the 11th of August 1942. So, Eagles still around, and Argus, believe it or not, is still around. Um, uh, Hermes is, of course, lost in Operation C. Courageous and Glorious are lost, and Ark Royal's been lost. So yeah, the Royal Navy's um, having fun with carriers. It loses three fleet carriers and one... Well, I would I would stick Hermes due to her air group size in the escort carrier size category. Because she was always in the cruiser category. And sometimes people... These days, when we're talking about carriers lost, they usually stick... They usually have escort, light, and fleet as their categories of carrier... Hmm. The point I would make is, yes, he could have lost them, but the entire doctrine, as the Royal Navy had drummed into him, and as the, was to go back and attack at night, uh, was to attack at night to offset the numerical advantage. Because remember, phase one, they always thought they were going to be fighting initially in numerical disadvantage, and they actually thought, honestly, in the transition of phase two, when they're going through the Straits of Singapore, they had a fear. They thought they would probably meet a mass Japanese navy down there. They did. That was one of their big things. They thought they'd end up fighting a battle in a confined space because if they were the Japanese, that's what they would have done: get them in a confined space and funnel them into submarines, into carrier strikes, into everything, and smash them. Basically, the Royal Navy knew quite well about the Japanese doctrine of Kantai Kesen. Remember, the Royal Navy has a lot of observers aboard Japanese ships during the Battle of Tsushima. And the Royal Navy has had very close links with the Japanese for many, many years. Even after the, lot of the end of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, the Royal Navy in the China Station were regularly meeting up with their Japanese colleagues and were exchanging conversations with them, ideas with them. And I'm sure the Japanese understood British thinking as well as they understood um, the British understood theirs. You know, there is a level of understanding that comes from talking to people. The thing is, though, and the point for the Japanese, uh, this is a point in the Royal Navy, so versus the Japanese, the Japanese are meeting a portion of the Royal Navy on a regular basis. The Royal Navy was meeting most of the Japanese Navy. But saying that again, this also meant that there is quite a large section of the Royal Navy which is just as dismissive of the Japanese as their American colleagues, because they've never met them, and they do fall into all the ideas of them, and often they get bumped on the head by senior officers who worked with the Japanese in the Mediterranean fleet in World War One, and people who've been on the China Station. Again, this is one of the problems you have with putting together officers to go to the Far East in... 1940, 41. Uh, the loss of Henderson, etc., and officers like him in 1939, and the, the, the other officers who've been lost, meant you'd lost some of the people who the Royal Navy had picked as their Far East specialists. Which had been their A team, because remember, Japan was the constant threat. Japan was the threat. The moment the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty was over, Japan becomes a threat. They're pointing guns at each other throughout quite a large chunk of the 1930s. You know, Tsingtao in January 1939, the one of the reasons why there isn't as much information preserved in the archives as I would like to, one of the reasons the documents were not kept, is because that was actually quite a run-of-the-mill engagement. I often pick it as the chance of war breaking out earlier in 1939, because it's the one that happens in 1939. But there's also the Asamamaru incident in 1940, which takes place off the coast, not far from Tokyo, where the Royal Navy, where HMS Liverpool stops a Japanese liner. And there are incidents in 1938, 37, 36, and don't think there's one in 35 from memory. There is one in 34, there's one in 33. Where the Royal and these incidents are all ones where the Royal Navy are actively pointing guns at the Japanese, pointing guns at them. Okay, um, there are incidents in 1935, but they don't follow that pattern. The Royal Navy is pretty brutal when it comes to war fighting, and this is you know brutal but efficient. Um, 
But this is where Somerville loses support, and this is he loses in nice place support in the wider navy as well on this front. Because if you think about the wider Royal Navy, you've got HMS Glowworm, which does a destroyer, which doesn't hesitate to try and take on Admiral Hippo despite being solo. Takes on two destroyers bigger than her, and it takes them on. You've got HMS Renown, which goes toe to toe with Star Horse and Eisenhower, doesn't back down. You've got an entire navy which is built on the pot of the thing that if you see the enemy, you attack. You know, this is why Craddock at doesn't get into trouble, isn't posthumously vilified after Cornell. He did the right thing. This is why HMS Rawla Pindy is remembered so well. Yes, she gets sunk, but she charged Arnold and Eisenhower, and she fought. But there's a, there's a significant difference there between those individual warships or individual squadrons and two-thirds of the uh, Royal Navy surviving carrier force. To be honest, yes, but there isn't. There, I can understand some of Bill's mindset. This is why he's not censored. I don't consider him. He doesn't do anything bad. He's just unlucky and doesn't isn't the full sum of all. But the trouble is, if you turned around and you put Cunningham in that position, or you put Harwood in that position at that time, or you put Philip Vian in that position. Can you imagine any three, or any of those three thinking, I'm commanding only two-thirds of the Royal Navy's carry force, my job is to preserve them, not to sink the enemy? Or can you imagine them all thinking, right then, so, we've got this opportunity, they can't do this at night, I have to hide during the day, but I have to find them again tonight, and then I have to take out as many of those carriers as I can. Well, I guess that's always going to be hanging in the air, isn't it, that question? That, that is... <laughs> And let's be honest, Cunningham would probably is the closest to Somerville in how he would probably think about the scenario, and he would still look at his actions in terms of fleet command, look at what he does uh, in the scenarios. He goes for the kill. He goes to destroy the enemy because he always thinks it's safest to destroy the enemy. Then they can't attack you. Yes, you're risking your two carriers out of four, so it's fifty percent of your carrier force more than that. But um, you're risking to, but you can take out the Japanese effort. And if the Japanese lose a large enough support of their carrier force in the Indian Ocean, how does that affect the rest of the war if that happens in 1942? How does that affect the rest of the war? It changes it dramatically. It pushes the Japanese onto the defensive much earlier. Um... It's just, it's not a good scenario for them. Now, of course, yes, there is also the problem, and the one that Jane brings up quite a lot is the idea of the Congos um, attacking the Royal Navy carriers. If they, you know, if the if the carriers left, you know, the Congos could try and force the issue. And to that, I don't think War Spike goes down without a fight, and I. Honestly, I'm not sure who I put money on with the War Spite versus the Congos in this scenario. Um, they do have all four Congos. They do have all four, and that should be an advantage. But if it's at night time, and considering War Spite's radar, and it is War Spite, I, I know there are people who like to sort of go, well, why are the British Shops have War Spite? If we consider her actions, she might have living plot armor. We're not sure. But leaving that to one side, does she, if in a night attack, does she hold, uh, can she deal with them, attack them at night, in a, a, you know, and destroy them? Potentially. But also, potentially, if those Congos aren't attacking at night, uh, if they, you know, in, if it's a night attack, I'd see it's British going offensive against the Congos. In which case, maybe they brought up the R's. In which case, you got the three 15-inch battleships versus the four 14-inch battle cruiser slash heading towards fast battleship. I would say at least two of them, after modernization, have reached the level of subdivision that would I would say would tip them closer to fast battleship. I have I have considered putting together a scale. 
a sliding scale, or basically a um, be a twelve point scale of zero equals battle cruiser in the purest form, dreadnought armor cruiser. Twelve equals battleship in the purest form, and then sort of doing that. But the moment you start putting a scale, people are going to go across the various periods and go, well, this one's obviously a battleship, and you go. It's not. It it's just it's the nineteen thirties equivalent of that, and that's that, that's almost you almost need to start putting together a scale of almost every single year. It, it's something to think about. The, the thing is, and this is why I say he doesn't do anything wrong. I can understand the reason of his argument and all these things. They are they are legitimate arguments. They are legitimate points and reckons. But also, can you imagine the Somerville of? January 1940, or maybe even May 1940. Can you imagine him making that decision and not going on the attack the next night? No. Somerville then was no, very aggressive himself and would have done it. I think what you've got there is you've got an officer who is very good officer, who's making a legitimate decision and doing a very correct decision, but he's not doing the right correct decision for what the Royal Navy wanted. And this is why... He could have been given more command. He could have been given more afterwards. But in the nicest way, as soon as the legitimate reason is found to replace him and move him on, he has moved to very much a shore posting. He has moved away from it. Yeah. And it goes back to the point, as I said, oh, command and keep being command does affect officers differently. The, and the Royal Navy knows it's not going to win a war in nicest way by acting safely. The Royal Navy has a long history and has this built in. It's if you consider what happened to World War Two, it's the Germans and the Italians and to an extent the Japanese, but less so the Japanese, who are worried about risking their ships and they hold their punches and pull their punches because they don't want to lose their ships. The Royal Navy if it's pulling its punches because it's worried about losing ships, it's not coming from the senior officer. It's not often. It, it doesn't come from the government, and it doesn't really come from the Royal Navy chain of command. When officer does it, they're understood, but they tend to find themselves quietly sidelined because the Royal Navy. You don't get naval supremacy. You don't get control. Of the world. You don't get the world's largest empire based on naval power by pulling your punches because you're. A afraid of losing ships. Even if they are critical ships, you don't do it because in most of this way, once you lose that naval supremacy, you've lost your empire. This is one of the reasons why Jellico often suffers arguments because of the fact he doesn't charge the um to Germans because he's worried about the torpedoes, etc. That that's the problem. That's why the view on Jellico versus Beatty is not as one-sided as it probably should be, because Jellico does achieve so much in the Battle of Jutland, etc. He he is really really very good, but he doesn't achieve. He doesn't char carry on and pursue the Germans. He breaks away. He saves his ships. He saves his crews. Which is the right decision. It's just not necessarily the correct right decision. Or rather, it's the correct decision, but not necessarily the right correct decision, as far as the Royal Navy is concerned. In terms of their history and their culture and their, the things that are imbued in them without even needing to ask. You've lost your reason for having a Navy in so many ways as far as Navy is concerned. So actually, here's the other thing. Is Operation C, and this point, the beginning of the end for the British Empire? Because if he hadn't pulled this punch, and if he had successfully managed to take out the, even the, not the Japanese carriers, that puts the British back in the ball game in the Pacific War. Because they're the ones who've taken out the Japanese carriers, not the Americans. Instead of Coral Sea and Midway being the big naval battles, suddenly you've got the Indian Ocean, the British took out the, America, uh, the Japanese carriers and the British get in and the British at this time still have more naval forces than the Americans so then the British are leading in the Pacific Legacy of the US Senate. The Americans will soon pass the British. I, I, I'm not contesting that or saying anything uh, this from that front but in this point 
Thanks to the Senate's underinvestment, yes. What? And then you get a whole new conundrum starts happening of what does the world look like post Second World War under that scenario. So this is one, arguably one of the biggest turning points for the world which comes after World War Two is this battle and is Somerville in a nicest way pulling his punches. Interesting point. I can understand why he did it. But I also have this feeling that a lot of the other Royal Navy officers, if they be, uh, several of the Royal Navy officers who've been involved in time, and remember, it's not just him who's suffering from the war, several of them would have been in a, uh, wouldn't have done the same thing. And you have, what I often think is, the pressure of command is either changing you, your personality in terms of you become less personable and you sort of become more sort of introverted, but you're still able to exercise command, or you keep your personality and you become more and more conservative in your command decisions. Because I, 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 that's how I see it goes. And I'm not sure, I can't say this for everyone, but that's when I'm looking at it, that's what I see broadly happens in the office. You have Vian, Cunningham, you have the director of construction, Stanley Goodall, who become slightly more, less such big personalities. They're still personal, they're still friendly on the individual level, but in terms of their fleet, they're not that big grandfather fatherly figure. But Somerville is still very much a very good, very nice, very kind, very bubbly, you know, lovely figure. But in his command decisions, he's becoming more and more conservative. All right, so um, Operation C was a pivotal point for the future of the Empire. Mm -hmm. um, Abyssinian Crisis, what sort of pivotal role did that play in the designs of the carriers? Or is that sort of overrated? I think the Abyssinian Crisis can be overrated in terms of its effect on this, the actual design, because the design was going that way anyway. But I think and I am going to start asking you questions in a second. <laughs> You're not going to let you get away this for the whole time. Um, as much as I realise it is your happy place. Where did the paintbrush appear from? Why have I suddenly got a paintbrush in my hand? I know I often have random things in my hand, but why do I suddenly have a paintbrush in my hand? Where did it come from? <laughs> Where's I it have, gone? It's, but what it does do is it provides justification in terms of them making the, them doing the things they wanted to do. It's one of those things that the Abyssinian crisis allows the those in charge of Royal Navy construction to really go look, we need it. We are what we've been making this case already, you know, we've heard us that make this case. Well, if you needed any proof, here's the Abyssinian crisis. And the British government suddenly has to go yeah. Okay, so then the next point is design. We've got the battle carriers. We've got the design concepts finally uh, made whole, put into form in, in steel and armor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the big criticism, I suppose, that I keep that's keep that, that is always being raised with me is, yes, but what about their metacentric meta height? They are so top heavy. Um, it's a bit hard to to judge uh, because again based only on personal accounts which is always a bit risky uh, people were saying well they were plenty stable enough um, but then again you look at a ship like um, the, the only real test that I can see was when um, Indomitable was torpedoed in Operation Husky and pretty much immediately went to, 11, to an 11 degree list um, that captain didn't like the idea of not counter flooding um, so he did what the enemy was wanting to, him to do so he let in water and the ship got back up onto a even, even keel and made its way home of course but you know we're talking a, a, an immediate sudden list of 11 degrees which isn't minor and um, you know, there's an awful lot of top weight there yeah yep the, the, the... The point is, that there is an awful lot of top weight, and yes, that affects the metacentric heights, but in the nicest way, you have that top weight for a reason, and you deal with it. Yeah. It's one of the interesting things I find when I'm looking at design, and my dad was, of course, a naval architect, and so I've spent my life around people like that, and I've 
still friends with a lot of his friends and still chat with them quite a lot. The whole point of the thing is, why has it got that top weight? It's got that top weight because that protects the ships from having and the air, ship's aircraft and the purpose of the ship. So you have that top weight for a reason, so then you design around it. And you design to make it work. And unfortunately, where that torpedo particularly hit was a particularly annoying place for the balancing act. And the whole counter-flooding thing, um, I always think it's a good job in, a, in some respects that Henderson wasn't, uh, did die when he did. Because I have a feeling if he'd ever heard an officer say that in his presence, they might have found him doing an Admiral Duncan with their neck. Because if you look at all Darth the work Vader. of Third Sea Lord and all the direct and the, the, the DMC and all the all the work that's been done in the Admiralty and in the direction of the construction and the design of carriers and these things, counter flooding is part of the damage control process the whole time. It's something which is not you're not supposed to take lightly, which is where some of the lines in the workbook come from. It's not supposed to be done something just rashly going, Oh yeah, we'll counter flood. You're supposed to be very cautious when you're doing it and they are very cautious when they do it. But that's not saying... Being cautious about doing something is not the same as not doing it. And the trouble is some people take the caution as meaning you don't do it, i.e. you don't let water into your ship, versus the actual thing is you don't do it... There's a key phrase in that concept, in the sort of you don't let water in, unnecessarily. And the unnecessarily word is... Basically, the DNC and the Third Sea Lords offices going, you can do this, but you need to be careful when you do it. Because there had been incidents where officers had been, oh yes, we must counter flat, and they'd end up the ship just seesawing because they'd managed to put in so much water. So they add in, they don't do it unless it's necessary, and you get people thinking that means you don't do it at all. As I said, in the nicest way, Third Sea, uh, Admiral Henderson or Actually, also, Admiral Fraser, the third sea lord, the guy who takes after, over after Henderson as third sea lord, would have both quite happily have done the full Admiral Duncan to a mutineer thing of dangling them out the window, holding them by their neck, going, You! You have lost me a carrier for being stupid! <laughs> you cannot read! And that, that's the thing! Okay, so I'm going to, um... Yeah... That's, that's the... <laughs> yeah, the, the, the more and more I read into some of the damage control stuff, the more and more damage you realise that was done by the loss of Courageous and Glorious when they were. Because you lost so many of the experienced damage control personnel. And you look at the loss of Ark Royal, and that's entirely down to not doing counter-flooding. And then there's people who well, you know, the manual says don't do it, and I go, there's, the word is unnecessary is after that. That 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 unnecessary covers a lot of me. That that word was put in because of I think it was an incident involving which of the characters I think it might have been Furious. Where she's da where she was damaged at some point in World War One. Well not when she's in her full carrier form. And there's a debate about counter flooding and the counter flood too almost too much, but I'm not sure if it is Furious. Uh, I could be wrong about that one. I would ha I'll have to go and look it up on National Archives. But yeah, the, the the amount of issues that come with that, the amount of silly, silly issues that come with that, and it's almost constant. It's constant silly issues. Now, I think I'm going to end this here as a part one. And I'm going to do that because I want this to go live tonight, but I'm also going to record a part two. So, I'm going to end it here, about the halfway point. It's an hour, of a, it's an hour into an hour and 58 video. And so there's going to be a part two of this. I'm not sure when it'll come out, but I'll record it and have it ready to go. Maybe it'll come out the Wednesday after things have been done or something. I'm not sure. But this, let's put it this way, I'm an hour into this video, and 
I'm an hour and 50 minutes into this video. So I'm an hour into watching this video, an hour and 50 minutes into recording video. So I've, I don't feel too bad because I'm adding quite a lot onto it. <laughs> I hope, I hope, oh. Yeah, it's a case of, is this a straight fight? I will add this one to what I was saying on it, of four Congos versus Warspite on her own. Not good. But if the British have taken out Soryu and Hiryu in a nice attack, and so left Akagi, Shokaku, Tsukaku, and the Congos and Tones, there's a different scenario than if they have also taken out Akagi, Shokaku, Tsukaku, you know, which were in Carrier Division 5 and Carrier Division 2. Or if they've taken out four of those, or three or four of those. And then you've got the Congos. Because at that point, then the Royal Navy can be launching strikes. And remember again, their entire fleet carrier stru structure of the, the Illustrious class was around constant strikes and constant operating. So uh, the whole thing had been Arc Royal is your alpha strike, big punch. Kind of like what the Americans and Japanese are both preparing, because again, fighting in the Pacific and basically concentrating on that, that suits that. The British had been looking at going, well, we might have to fight our way through Singapore Straits, fight our way up the South China Sea, fight our way through the Mediterranean. Okay, these scenarios are going to require ships which can do this, constant operations and constant cycles, and are orientated around that. I'm not saying the American ships, Japanese ships, can't do that. I'm saying they're not oriented. Their design and their shaping of their an organisation is not orientated around that as the primary. It's a secondary. Whereas for the British, it's the primary, and the Alpha Strike is the secondary when you're looking at the carriers like Illustrious class. It's the joys of emphasis, and it's the effects of the naval treaties. Honestly, I think if you hadn't had the naval treaties, I think you could well have seen that the carriers, especially the Royal Navy and the US Navy producing, would be a lot closer to each other. They'd be still separated by emphasis, probably, and the reality, the reality of their geostrategic situation, but they would be a lot closer. A lot closer. Hmm. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying. And look out for part two when it comes out. Toodles.